Hello to everybody. My name is Carolina Vigura and I have the pleasure to chair the today's meeting. This is a meeting which takes part, uh, takes place in uh, the series of Warsaw European Forum, which is organized by Cultura Liberalna uh, together with the Foundation for Polish-German Cooperation, the Zeit Foundation and the Fried Ort Foundation. We have been meeting here uh, throughout the past few months, starting in March, uh, trying to grasp uh, what is going on after the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, after the Russian aggression on Ukraine on February 24th. And our question from the very beginning was, uh, what are the middle and long consequences of this war for Europe, for Ukraine, for Russia, and for the transatlantic relations? Today, we are going to talk about uh, the disintegration and integration tendencies in the European Union uh, as a consequence of uh, the war in Ukraine. And I am joined by marvelous speakers today. I will now, uh, I will now introduce them and then I will give the floor to them. So we are joined today uh, in the, uh, in the uh, order they will be speaking. Uh, by Eugeniusz Smolar. Hello, Eugeniusz. Uh, Eugeniusz Smolar is a senior fellow at the Center for International Relations and former director of the Polish section BBC World Service. Also, we are uh, today um, joined by Robert Cooper, who is a British diplomat and a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, also, uh, we are um, joined by Mark Leonard. Hello, Mark. Hello. The co-founder and director of the European Council on Foreign Relations. And as you can see, the European Council on Foreign Relations is dominating today's meeting. <laughs> uh, a proof of that is that we are also joined today by uh, Sylvie Kaufmann. Uh, hello, Sylvie. Uh, editorial director of Le Monde, now at sabbatical with the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin, but also a member of the ECFR. ECFR. And um, last but not least, uh, Petro Burkowski, uh, Executive Director at the Ilko Kusheriv Democratic Initiative Foundation. Hello to everybody, warm welcome. And uh, now I will, uh, without too much ado, give the floor to Eugeniusz Smolar, who will be the first to take the floor today. And then we will have the introductory remarks from the other panelists. Yes, hello, hello everybody, hello friends. Well, uh, I find myself in the south of France at the moment, and trust me, I, I expect a revolution in France very soon. I haven't realized how deep the crisis is before I arrived yesterday here, went shopping to a supermarket and found out that no one can buy Dijon mustard, and not just now, but for some weeks already, uh, as well as Bon Maman strawberry jam. It's just not possible to buy. So I expect revolution in France really soon, you know. Um, integration, disintegration tendency. I tend to take a long view. Um, being a warring type, I look with the particular attention to the attitudes uh, as well of pro-European democratic, mainly liberal forces. Poland is of course on my mind, but in a broader European context. Well, uh, I'm not going to dwell on the Polish and Hungarian government's tendencies to build liberal democracies because they are obvious sources of disintegration. Under the banner of sovereignty and national dignity, the governments are pursuing the policies of state capture um, and to conquer all institutions and instruments of power, eliminate uh, the level playing field for, uh, for elections. And uh, as it seems, their objective is not just to do what they want to do, but to obtain a free hand within the country, rejecting the right to review government policies by the European Court of Justice or the European Commission or the European Parliament. The crucial problem is not the policies of the peace government, Kaczynski's government, but the fact, as I see it, that the liberals, also the left, have been unable to provide a credible alternative and necessary political leadership for very many voters, not just in Poland. The Liberals, of course, support the integration, fearing that to retain power, Kaczynski will risk everything, including threatening polexit and falsification of elections. The Liberals proclaim that the European Union is us, that by joining the club, 
we accepted all its rights and obligations and sharing sover sovereignty serves Poland very well. However, fearing that the criticism will be used by xenophobic sovereignists, they avoid addressing several problems. Let me mention just five. The relationship between the EU institutions and the member states. The relationship between the largest and the smaller member states with, with the particular role of Germany and France. The collapse, I claim, the collapse of standing and confidence in the leadership of Germany and France in Central Eastern Europe because of the war uh, in Ukraine, but not just that. Moves towards federalization of Europe and calls for the majority voting across the board, including foreign and security policy. And the last, which I'm not going to discuss in the first part of this discussion, is the role of national identities. I recognize an acute need for further integration. Let's make it absolutely clear. But I also see sources of disintegration in conflicts between the legitimate objectives of deepening integration with the potentially damaging ways this is being implemented. I hear many calls for deepening integration, but I don't see much of a purposeful process. And as you know, European Union is all about process. Just a recent, a recent example. Conference for the Future of Europe was praised as an example of participatory democracy in action, delivering expected pro-integrationist results picked up immediately and enthusiastically by the president of the commission, by the European parliament, who called for a treaty change. Well, I, it hardly helped the process of further integration when in response to, in, uh, to the push for treaty change, 13 out of 27 countries snapped back in a letter in which we read, we do not support unconsidered and premature attempts to launch a process towards treaty change. The letter was signed not just by post-communist Bulgaria, Croatia, Czech Republic, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, and Slovenia, but also by Denmark, Finland, Sweden, and last but not least, Malta. I claim that attempts to introduce majority voting in foreign security policy will contribute to a deepening of tensions between a new, much unstable axis of France, Germany, and Italy, and a smaller member states who ask a common policy to do what? How will it relate to NATO and the Transatlantic Alliance? I fear that the objections of many are based on a lack of trust towards France and Germany and their ability to lead in ways that would include all. Building a common foreign and security policy is desirable and necessary because of Russia, but also because of long-term changes in the strategic posture of the United States, Trump or no Trump. There is also a fear of lack of bipartisanship, toxic politics, looming constitutional crisis, and the threat of political violence in the United States. In the present conditions, however, with unilateral calls for a sovereign Europe, unsupported by purposeful process, had to hit a brick wall of opposition to a kind of political autistic blindness, as they are not just unrealistic now, but harmful to the delicate balance between the member states. Strong words, I suppose, into our liberal ears. And the issue have been exploited by sovereignists and have been overlooked or sidelined by liberals in the public debate in Poland. Any reservations regarding the traje trajectory of development of the European Union is regarded by the supporters of integration as a threat. However, by keeping silent, they abandon the field to the sovereignist demagogy. The conflict between the patriots and the cosmopolitan traitors who are supposed to follow the European mainstream, read Germany and France, suits those like Kaczynski and Orban as a significant part of public opinion instinctively favors the patriots and calls for a greater say by nation state. And of course, we know that this is just a bullshit. Now, uh, Germany is not just the case of Nord Stream 2, which is an example of disregard of interest, sense of security and union principles of solidarity and loyal cooperation with Poland, Baltic states, not to mention Ukraine as well. 
The result of putting German interests first at the expense of EU internal cohesion is not just Germany, but the whole of Europe pays a very high price now for energy dependence of, uh, on Russia to the detriment of security and the Union's common energy policy. We all, we all know that. But it took more than a month of the war and above all the massacre of civilian population in Ukraine before German President Frank Walter Steinmeier, former foreign minister, decided to dissociate himself from the previous support for the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, admitting on April, April 12 uh, interview, and I quote, now not only has a multi-billion euro project failed, but our behavior has also resulted in a loss of credibility with our East European partners. How very true, but it does not change the fact that the German governments of Merkel and Steinmeier, political parties, big business, acted for years as Russia's enablers. As the fundamental security is at stake now, let's look at the Chancellor Scholz's explanation of why Germany had been refusing to provide Ukraine with the heavy weapons. In his Der Spiegel interview in April, he said, our country bears responsibility for peace and security throughout Europe. We must do everything possible to avoid a direct, direct military confrontation between NATO and a highly armed superpower like Russia, a nuclear power. Now, as Poland became a, a, a frontier state, bearing in mind Scholz's words, we have to ask whether there is a basis for trust that the German allies will come to our aid in a times of a genuine need. Just a simple question. Can Poland be confident to receive supplies of spare parts and ammunition from France or Germany in a warlike situation unconditionally? Won't we hear that the Germany who apparently bears a special responsibility for the peace of Europe, won't do it as, I quote, the country bears responsibility for peace and security throughout Europe. This is a crucial question and the basis for question marks which I put here. Well, France is different from Germany because France presidents, and not just the last one, Macron, they just go out and proclaim to the world a very ambitious project but the fact of the matter is that since 1989 and since the enlargement, France did not have any strategy towards Central Eastern Europe. I speak from experience based on many uh, meeting diplomats at the highest level of France, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Defense. Consecutive French president from Chirac to Macron regarded the regional members of the Union with a lack of interest and understanding of their concerns, somehow assuming that they will follow the elders at the expense of their basic national interest. Well, I dare say this will not happen. And uh, I can perfectly understand uh, French mistrust and refusal to engage with the present illiberal government in Warsaw, but deepened integration in foreign defense policies are years away anyhow, and the governments come and go. So where is the strategy? Now, the Polish government propaganda is overjoyed, as can present such policy as an attempt to reduce Poland to the role of a client state, which it will refuse to become one. Whoever will be in power. And I tend to believe that governments come and go, even in Poland, but the lack of trust tends to linger. And if France expects respect and loyalty, it cannot act as if this is a one-way street. Now, the, I'm ending by saying that the future of European and global security will be, of course, decided in Ukraine, as this aggression needs to be seen as an assault on the fabric and fiber of European democratic, pluralistic, liberal society. Uh, but war in Ukraine proves that if the security of Poland has to depend on anyone, then let it be a power whose policies historically and then in the present context prove that will come to our aid in times of need more likely. And such a power is not the European Union, is not France, is not Germany. It is NATO and the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenek. And at the same time, thank you also for being so um, so prompt and, and um, for, for speaking really your your 10 minutes, uh, but I would very much like to, to ask you one more question uh, regarding Poland. Um, there is, 
quite a discussion right now uh, on the Poland's behavior after the Hungarian ally has disappointed Warsaw. And also uh, with regard to the, the new instability in the region and uh, uh, the feeling of insecure, that uh, of being insecure that is shared by many Poles. The question is whether now, after the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, Poland, in your opinion, will be more eager to play by the Brussels rules or not? Uh, you're asking about present government and my answer is no. Mm -hmm. Because of the um, new role uh, Poland found itself as a hub for assistance to Ukraine, whether in military terms, civilian uh, assistance and also humanitarian assistance for the millions of refugees that landed in Poland, I believe that this government has been empowered in, in its relations, both with the United States, but also in relation with the European Union. And uh, they are example of that. They are becoming more bullshit about all that, you know, in their relation. They believe that the history proved them right and that uh, they can proceed with their policies uh, in Poland, if not for the money they care mm -hmm. about that would come from the European Union, they would believe that they have a free hand altogether. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Genek. Uh, and I would now like to turn to Robert Cooper and ask you, Robert, to take the floor as the, uh, as the second person. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina. You, you introduced me as a British diplomat. Um, I prefer to think of myself as a European diplomat. Uh, the best obviously, years of my life. Obviously, a European uh, diplomat. You're so right. Well, I, unfortunately, I'm stuck with a British passport, um, but the best years Brexit. of my life were spent <laughs> working for uh, Javier Solana and then Cathy Ashton. Um, uh, this is, suddenly we find ourselves uh, back in a, uh, in a world of great power politics. Um, uh, but the EU uh, is not going to be a great power in the traditional mode. Um, it's not going to, uh, uh, it's not very good at threatening violence. Uh, it's not very good at executing violence. Um, I can't actually imagine it playing a traditional great power role. Um, and yet it's an extraordinarily powerful institution. Um, and uh, the proof of that uh, is that it has changed the face of Europe. Um, but unlike previous um, uh, countries that changed the face of Europe um, at different times, France, the Netherlands, Spain, um, Germany, um, uh, the, the EU has done it in a much stranger and more subtle and I think more lasting way. It's uh, actually uh, previous attempts to buy great powers on Europe have been imperialist. Um, and uh, the result is that we think that what we have in the European Union is a collection of ex-imperial powers. Uh, there's hardly a European power. Well, there is one, there's Ireland, uh, which was a victim of imperialism. Um, but for the rest, sometime or other, almost all of them had empires. Uh, and they're all ex-imperial powers. And that's, that's a, a, I think, quite a good thing to be. I think of the EU as having been founded on um, Jean Monnet's observation that um, you don't do things together because you're friends, you become friends because you do things together. Um, and uh, so what the EU has done, the way in which it's transformed Europe, is it has um, uh, uh, created a whole series of joint tasks for people to do together. And the result of that is, has been this quite astonishing change in, in the EU. And although the EU is not itself, itself a, it's not a great power in the traditional way, um, it does have one superpower, um, and that is uh, enlargement, uh, the capacity to, uh, to change other countries as well. And the curious thing is that many of them seem to wish to to join and to be changed uh, by this process because they see the success and they quite naturally want to join in. Um, but uh, it is important um, 
that the EU uh, actually has uh, has real business to do. Um, that's why uh, I'm uh, slightly skeptical about um, the uh, President Macron's talk about a political community. Um, if a political community means that everybody gets together and talks, um, well, I've not got anything against that. Um, but what's it actually going to do? Um, yeah. It's actually doing things together that makes the difference because the process of doing together what the EU does um, started with uh, coal and steel, uh, developed then into a free trade zone, then into a customs union, uh, then a monetary union. Um, all of those are tasks, are, are jobs, which are critical to each individual nation. Everybody has real interests at stake in the EU debates. Um, and the process is messy, but in the end, it almost always takes, manages to make decisions. Um, and, and that in itself, that it even works, is, almost, is also remarkable. But it not only works, it actually has brought countries together in different sort of relationship from the, the previous, um, thousands of years. Uh, 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 and as I say, there is this, the one great power is the fact that others wish to join. Uh, and we see that rather vividly now in the, in the case of Ukraine. Um, and I think that we could probably do the, uh, the, the process a bit better than it's done at the moment. Um, uh, it's inevitable that um, uh, enlargement, because it involves treaty change, um, involves decisions made by unanimity. Um, uh, but actually, the only decision you need to take by unanimity is the final decision uh, to sign the treaty. Um, uh, I think it's a mistake that the decision to open negotiations is taken by unanimity. There's no need for that. Um, uh, you can open negotiations at any time on the basis, you could do it on the basis of a qualified majority. However, um, uh, it wouldn't, they wouldn't reach a conclusion except by unanimity. So we ought, I think, to be more flexible about how we open negotiations. Um, we ought to be entirely inflexible about how we end them uh, because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a legal requirement. Um, uh, but the um, uh, uh, but the 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 site, for example, of um, uh, 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 this or that uh, member state um, complaining about um, uh, something they don't like in North Macedonia um, is, it seems to me, is actually rather humiliating for the European Union. Um, uh, you can. Uh, unanimity for ending negotiations, yes, but um, uh, uh, but not for beginning them. Um, and in the process, we the EU could be much more flexible than it is. Not it, not it by the conclusion. The the other thing um, to say about the way in which it exercises this supremely important power, which is to to bring others into the union, um, uh, uh, is that. Um, in doing so, um, it seems usually to be very tough on the member states who are, who are joining. Um, it's not sufficiently tough on the member states who are already there. Um, it's actually not even tough enough on some of the ones who are joining. Once you've been recognized as a candidate country, um, everybody treats you as though the problems are over. Actually, it's not true. Um, there are some declared candidates country, countries who've been systematically going backwards as far as the Copenhagen criteria are concerned. That's to say, um, uh, the rule of law and democracy. Um, and those are fundamental to the European Union. This is a community of law. If you ask what it does, it makes laws. Uh, that's why um, uh, the um, manipulation of courts in Poland um, is uh, really a serious question for the European Union. Um, uh, and even more serious is the manipulation of the press uh, and the democratic system in Hungary. So the EU ought to be um, 
uh, more sympathetic to applicants uh, and more tough on itself. I think that's probably the um, uh, the, the message that I that I want to to underline. It should uh, above all, it should maintain um, uh, high standards on uh, political questions on, and on the and on the rule of law. Just wanted to to ask one more question to you, Robert, because. I have been very much influenced in the past few months by the book by Sergei Poche, The Lost Kingdom, in which he uh, describes the, the, the development of uh, Russian politics and culture um, as an unsuccessful attempt to uh, to deal with uh, one's with, with with one's great empire in their uh, case, and he says. Um, being Russian, Russianness uh, still is a kind of a cluster of imperialism and nationalism bound together with no uh, clear borders of what the, nation, the, the, the Russian nation is. This is what what the what the Russian imperialism in in the interpretation of Poche means, and. In this in this context, Europe uh, not being a great power but having some uh, great uh, uh, strengths. To what extent, uh, in the context of what, what you have been saying, uh, Europe may be uh, an alternative of uh, of an identity project uh, to to the project uh, of Russian imperialism. For me, the most striking case. Um, is uh, you know, British people, when you tell them the story about the EU having brought peace, they say, oh, yes, 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 yes. But uh, it didn't, didn't really matter for us because we were an island. Um, actually, they forget that we're not an island, that we had a land border with Ireland. Um, uh, and it was a very troubled land border too. And um, uh, joining the European Union, as we did simultaneously with Ireland, made an enormous amount of difference. Um, it meant that for the first time, um, uh, the British and Irish governments talked to each other um, on a certain level of equality, not equality in size and that kind of thing. But um, uh, we were both members of the same organization and we needed each other's help. Um, and for the first time, it was a dialogue between uh, equals rather than a former imperial power and, a, um, and the victim of the former imperial power. So. I, I think that Europe actually resolves. Um, now, Russia would be a little bit big for the EU to uh, digest, um, but uh, uh, nevertheless, I think that it's precisely the fact that we are uh, that we are all ex-imperial powers um, that uh, it, because this is a non-imperial relationship between member states. Um, okay, they're big and small. Uh, the big ones make a lot more noise than the small ones. So the small ones could cause a lot of trouble too. Um, but uh, but fundamentally, it's it's an equal society, uh, and and that's really important, I think. So um, uh, it wouldn't suit Russia. Thank you so much, uh, Robert, and um, Mark Leonard. Uh, please uh, take the floor. Great. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating discussion, and um, um, I. Uh, maybe try and provide a bridge between the two um, first uh, sets of comments, because um, I think if you put them together, one way of, of reading it is, is that Robert describes with enormous power and, uh, and elegance um, what has laid behind the, the kind of first seven decades of European integration and what's made it into such a, a wonderful and magical political project, the fact, way that it's, it's changed the whole idea of, of, of how power can be organized in quite a fundamental way. It's something that Robert's been describing brilliantly for a long time. It was one of the big inspirations to me when I wrote my book about why Europe will run the 21st century, Robert's idea of the, the postmodern state. But I, I do think that we're entering a a new moment at the moment uh, uh, um, where um, it feels like the 24th of, of February marked the end of a, of a cycle, mm -hmm. certainly um, a cycle 
of European security, which, which started at the end of the Cold War in 1981, 1991, and which I think is, is now um, uh, over. And in that sense, I think what Gienic was saying before shows that even though there's a lot of talk about European integration and the West coming together, this is predominantly a nationalist moment. Um, and the onset of, of war has fundamentally changed the way that many Europeans are, are thinking about some of the core ideas which have defined the, the seven decades of European integration that Robert talked about. And, you know, where I think at the beginning of a process of rethinking, and I hope that a lot of the wonderful things that Robert described will, will survive this, but I think they are going to be rethought. So I, what I was going to do is just talk a bit about how European integration and the meaning of integration changes when we move from being uh, a, a peace project, the most successful peace project in history, into a war project. Because fighting and winning this war is now the, the sort of central driver of European integration and European discussion. I, I do think that the first 100 days, or 120, 30 days of, of the war aren't necessarily a very good guide to the next 100 days. I think Yenik described the first 100 days and the political dynamics around that very well. I think the political dynamics are going to be very different in the next 100 days. But I, I wouldn't mind being staying more conceptual on this. And I think there's sort of five key things which Europeans are, are really thinking at the moment and I just want to mention them um, uh, because I think that will help move the discussion forward and the first and the most obvious one is is about the idea of, of violence and, and hard power um, and uh, that is something which you know we've had to confront in difficult ways before in, in with the fall of Yugoslavia there were some quite fundamental discussions in Germany and other countries about the, the use of military force uh, but, you know, I think that this is a more profound uh, change that we're seeing through German rearmament, Denmark's decision to, to participate in joint European defence arrangements, Sweden and Finland's decision, um, some of the ways that taboos are being broken with the EU actually paying for military force. I agree with, with Robert that the EU is not necessarily going to be able to behave like a great power. But what is obviously changing is not just the fact that hard power is kind of back and that there is a European sense that the peace dividend is over, that we're going to be spending hundreds of billions of, of euros that were invested in domestic issues. But also we're rethinking how our economies work. We're moving from seeing the economies mainly in the terms that, that Robert was talking about to, to thinking about our economy as a weapon against Russia, but also we are building a war economy based where, where security outstrips uh, efficiency in lots of different ways, starting with the sort of decoupling with, with, with Russian oil and gas. And that leads me to the sort of second big change, which is, I think, the most fundamental one. But at the core of what Robert was saying is this idea that you can turn enemies into friends by building interdependence and that interdependence is the foundation for economic interdependence, is the foundation for, for political reconciliation, for legal interdependence. And we saw uh, interdependence as something which reduced conflict and which created security. And I think it, it does in lots of magical ways that, that Robert talked about. But what we're seeing in our relationship with Russia is that interdependence makes us feel vulnerable and, 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 and is a threat. And that is quite a profound shock to our mental maps. The idea that, that interdependence uh, is potentially a, a big risk and has to be handled very carefully so that you don't um, uh, allow other people to blackmail you. Again, this didn't start on the 24th of February. We had a, a kind of big debate about China during COVID with all the mass diplomacy and vaccine nationalism and 5G and other issues. But I think that this is, has been a real blow to the way that many people think about interdependence. The third kind of big area which I think is being rethought is the whole idea of, of sovereignty itself. One of the reasons that the, the intra-European debates have been so painful is because the, the big driving 
force between European integration for the last few decades has been based on, on the problem of sovereignty and the, the ruinous violence that <laughs> was committed in its name. And our biggest concern has been about taming sovereignty. And Robert talked about the coal and steel community. It's not a coincidence that people started with coal and steel and tried to build a common community around the industries which have been used to arm countries and which had driven so much uh, death and destruction across the continent. And that was a real miracle, um, the idea of, 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 of managing to, uh, to tame the national sovereignty of, of, of Europeans um, through the building of this supranational uh, uh, environment. But faced with, with uh, an aggressive revisionist power in Russia, many Europeans uh, are now uh, obsessed with the defense of sovereignty and they realize that, um, that sovereignty needs to be uh, protected before it can be pulled which is why we're so focused on defending Ukrainian sovereignty. But also uh, the other big shock to us has been the way that Russia has been perverting some of the post-sovereignist rhetoric, which was used by Europeans during the Balkan Wars to justify their own invasion of, of, of Ukraine, um, where it kind of talks about, you know, defending Russian speakers from genocide. But the way that they're sort of systematically using all of the arguments that we use to justify our revision of, of our ideas of sovereignty in, in Kosovo, in other cases, which led to the R2P, is obviously not very convincing to Europeans who lived through those things and saw the kind of vast differences between the painful steps that one went through to build a legal justification for it and, and, and the other elements that go on. But I, I think that um, in the post-Cold War era, we were quite relaxed about redefining the limits of sovereignty and focusing more on the rights of individuals and less on the rights of states, because we thought we would be the main people who would decide that we had a responsibility to protect others or a right to intervene in other countries' affairs. And what we're now seeing in the place of that postmodern idea of the responsibility to protect, which Europeans built in such a painstaking and, 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 and complicated way, is a pre-modern idea of the responsibility to protect, which the Russians are using, which the Saudis have used to, to help Shia, uh, sorry, Sunni people in, in, in Yemen, which the Iranians used to defend Shia in other places. And, and we kind of um, uh, are quite repelled and, and disgusted by it. And we're very worried that what will happen if the Chinese start using this to defend uh, ethnic Chinese people in different places. So I think there is a kind of question about, um, about post-sovereignism. But I think, and that relates to the kind of fourth element which I would look at, which is the idea of, of universalism. So I'm as guilty of universalism on behalf of Europe as anyone else. I even wrote a book about why Europe would run the 21st century, which would be about how the, the EU model of international cooperation could spread osmotically to all corners of the world. But I think um, we've had a number of, of lessons, you know, from, what happened with Turkey, you know, the annexation of, of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, the, the annexation of Crimea, what's just happening now with the war to show that, that this European model is unlikely to even encompass the whole of the European continent, let alone the whole world. And I think that is leading us to, 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 to rethink um, uh, how, uh, the world is going to be organized. I've been very struck in, in when I met African, Asian, Middle Eastern leaders, that they don't share a lot of the moral outrage which, which characterizes the West response to Russia's invasion. They see the conflict as a regional European conflict rather than the world war. And I think our Eurocentrism has not only meant that we misread Putin and Erdogan and others, it's also meant that we're very bad at communicating with the rest of, of the world. And I think increasingly, we're going to be focused more on European exceptionalism and understanding how the EU that Robert dis described is a product of a particular history and a geography, um, which uh, is wonderful and worth preserving, but it's not necessarily a universal thing. And actually in a paradoxical way, decentering Europe could be quite a necessary first step to exercising European power because we need to be more curious about how others see the world and better mm -hmm. And that brings me to the kind of fifth and final point which I want to make, which is 
the idea of, of, of kind of, uh, of, of political order, because I, I think that um, uh, part of our exceptionalism related to the way that we thought about, uh, about order, and we had a particular idea about European order, which was based on a set of institutions and treaties, um, which has obviously been fraying for a long period of time, and I think is now uh, totally destroyed. And I think in the future, um, you know, European security is going to have to be uh, defended in ways more like that of other regions, with the balance of power and military might um, being the basis of our security with Russia, rather than any treaties or mutual understanding about what we're talking about. But also, we're going to have to get used to, to disorder being the norm, because it's unlikely we are going to be able to settle this fully, even if you end up with some sort of agreement on borders and on territories, which um, I hope can, can happen. Uh, I think it's, a, it's not the most likely scenario. We can't deal with all of the, the other kind of elements of, about what I call the age of unpeace, where you get cyber attacks, energy cutoffs, election interference. There'll be all sorts of different ways in which interdependence is weaponized between us and Russia, which means that, that this order will be the kind of norm rather than some uh, European architecture. And I, so I think if you take all of those things together, what we're going to see is a big sort of rethinking of, uh, of, of the whole idea of, uh, of Europe in ways which I fear could be very destructive, because I hope that what we can do is, is hold on to some of the magic that, that Robert described and find ways of preserving it. But one of the dangers of the sort of shift which, which Yenek's talking about at the beginning is that um, a lot of nationalists within Europe do feel empowered, re-empowered, and uh, basically arguing that some of the European mythology about the last few decades was just that, and that we're now back to the real world, we're living in the jungle, we need to have to behave in the jungle. I don't think that's right. I hope we can distinguish between the internal EU order and the order mm -hmm. outside, and that's where the enlargement question becomes very important as well. We, how mm -hmm. do we have a sphere of influence that goes beyond the existing EU? What happens to countries uh, which are in the outer uh, uh, perimeters of it, which are unlikely to, to make it into the European Union, but which we don't want to see in a Russian sphere of influence. But anyway, I'll stop uh, there. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. I still uh, will take the, the chance to ask you one my, my one question uh, using the position of the chair. Um, you have mentioned five ideas, and I have been thinking whilst you were talking about the idea of never again. I thought... Um, the European remembrance and the motto of, uh, of Never Again has been also a an, an, an very important and very central uh, part of Europe, of the European project. And today uh, it very uh, strongly uh, seems that in order to maintain the motto Never Again, one has to be, um, uh, one has to engage in the war instead of being pacifistic. So to what extent you think that also uh, reconsidering of the never again motto or idea is also indispensable apart from the five ideas you have mentioned? Very interesting for me going through a, a sort of second period of, of war in Europe in my lifetime. A lot of those debates about never again in the, in the 90s were incredibly painful. And I, my first job was working in the British Parliament in 92, and this sense of powerlessness in the face of genocide in Bosnia was extreme. But I think it was a different world in that there we could actually, you know, we, we, would, we would have been able to actually prevent a lot of the genocide. It was a, an order which we largely controlled. The Cold War had ended. Um, and it was our choice not to do anything about it. The situation now is, is very different, faced with a, a, a kind of Russian superpower that's invading its neighbor. I think it's absolutely right that we should do everything we can to, to, to help Ukraine uh, defend itself. But there are these battles going on between different European countries. Poland is on the one side, I think, that feels that it is at war and, and worries um, about being invaded itself. And then most of the rest of Europe, and I, I don't agree that there's an East-West divide because I think the divide cuts right through Eastern Europe. 
And there are huge differences between Poland and Romania and Hungary and other countries. I think there's a bigger divide within Eastern Europe than there is between East and West. Countries that worry more about nuclear escalation, the, the cost of living, et cetera. And I, I think that, that never again um, is being, it, it, you know, is still there, but it's being thought of differently uh, in, in different places. And that reflects partly also the, the kind of horrors that, that you know, Europe, because the European project has been an escape from our history, but our histories have been different. So never again also means quite different things from country to country. And that's part of what, what um, is happening in these different historical analogies, which are coming to the fore uh, in different national debates and, and arguments. I think in Germany, this is very interesting debate about whether the First World War or the Second World War is the best mm -hmm. um, historical model. I'm not sure either is perfect for, for where we're at the moment, but it is interesting how never again can mean completely different things from place to place. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, we have still two panelists and not so much time, but that's what happens when you have too many interesting persons and speakers and you want to squeeze it all into one event. Um, well, we'll have, we'll, let's make a try. Um, I will now give the floor to, to Sylvie Kofman. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Carolina. Thank you to all the previous speakers. This is very, very interesting. Um, so I'll try to be uh, brief. You, I, I'll go back to the themes of the discussion that you put uh, originally, integration and disintegration tendencies. Um, I think Robert quoted Jean Monnet, so I'll quote Jean Monnet again. I think he said that uh, the, the European Union, I mean, it was not the European Union at the time, but Europe grows through crisis. And uh, over the past uh, uh, crisis, uh, the Euro crisis, the, the Corona, the pandemic crisis, um, those crises had an integrating effect on, on, on the European Union. This one, I don't know. I mean, this is such a shock. This war is such a shock. Uh, the enormity of the shock of the European Union of this war is um, still very difficult to, to fathom. I think it's still, it's still a work in progress, uh, the effect on the EU. Uh, it's at this stage, it's difficult to say uh, which of those two tendencies will take over, but because I think they are both at play at the moment. So uh, let me uh, talk first about the integration tendencies. Um, we have seen already an integrating effect. We have seen this unity on the sanctions, at least on the six first packages, uh, the, the seventh obviously being more difficult. And as, as we go further, it's getting more difficult, but this has been, um, I think, quite, strong unity by, by EU standards. Uh, we've seen the EU using device that nobody heard of like before, like the European Peace Facility, facility to, uh, to finance weapons delivery. Uh, we've seen Denmark uh, uh, having a voting massively in a referendum to join uh, the European Defense Union. Um, uh, we've seen uh, the European convince the other uh, the, the member states to give uh, candidate status to Ukraine. And I, I really want to point out how important this move to grant um, candidate status to Ukraine is important, you know, ha has been. It, it's, it's, I think it's really a major, um, a, a very significant uh, event for an historical uh, event for the uh, European Union. Um, I think there is another possible possible integrating effort, but uh, effect, but we don't know what's. It's still very much in in the realm of the unknown. It's the German Zeitenwende, the, this uh, turning point, which has been announced by Chancellor Scholz. If it's if it gives uh, way to something really meaningful. Uh, if those 100 billion euros spent on defense are spent on European defense industry and not on uh, buying uh, only American equipment, for instance, you know, it could, it's potentially uh, uh, a strong uh, integrating factor. We don't know whether it's going to happen, but this is uh, potentially. Um, on disintegration tendencies, um, well, this challenge um, of 
uh, of integrating Ukraine. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a strategic project for, for, for Europe, which, uh, which could potentially transform uh, the EU in the next decade. But it can also um, have, have uh, negative effects. It can have both integrating and disintegrating effects. I think the trip to Kiev uh, of the four leaders was symbolic. I mean, it was important. It had big consequences, of course, uh, on, on the candidate status of, of Ukraine. But I think it was also important because you had those three leaders of Western uh, European countries and uh, the president of Romania, a Central European country. Uh, I think this was not, the significance of this group was not um, understood or, or felt uh, strongly enough in my part of Europe, in the Western part of Europe, but I thought the message was very important. Um, so, uh, and, and the work they did together to convince also other member states to accept this candidate status was, uh, I think, was important. Um, but integrate, giving the candidate status to Ukraine and um, Moldova, as Robert said, the big power of the EU is the enlargement power. I fully agree with this. And the fact that uh, President Zelensky so... Uh, the accession or the candidate status as a weapon for him or protection for him really uh, speaks volumes about how still the EU is uh, about the power of attraction that EU still retains. But this decision uh, shakes up completely the enlargement process, which is which was not working well anyway. And we, uh, if I if I can just spare a minute on the French. Uh, uh, position, you know, France had to be a complete, complete turnaround on, on its enlargement policy. France was always, I mean, for a long time, was very reluctant to enlargement it, it, uh, uh, with the argument that it was better to deepen and reform the EU before enlarging it, because enlarging it would be uh, giving um, way to possible disintegration or dilution, let's say. And, and now it has, it, you know, it has had to, to take a, 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 another position and, of course, worrying about the effect of, on the Western Balkans. And there we have another uh, possible uh, disintegrating factor. What is going to happen in, uh, in the Western Balkans under the pressure of this uh, different enlargement process now, how we are, how is the EU going to deal with uh, these countries which have been candidate for a long time and, and um, who are not um, uh, yet integrated or even on the way to integration. Um, so this is something which, when I talked about work in progress earlier, this is something which is still very much on the table. We don't know how we're going to solve this. There is, of course, this proposal of, of um, Macron and of Enrique, Enrique Coletta uh, of Italy before him about, you know, whatever you call it, European political community, uh, which was, for understandable reasons, uh, received quite negatively uh, in the beginning because um, it was seen because of past experiences. Uh, in terms of Mitterrand, I don't have time to go back to this, but also because it was seen by um, several countries uh, in Central Europe uh, as uh, uh, an alternative to enlargement. And I don't think it is. I think it is, I think the idea behind this proposal is good. What we don't know is how, to imp how it can be implemented. But the idea that there should be something to fill the vacuum between the moment where a country is candidate and the moment where it is integrated, uh, there's sense, you know, it makes sense because we saw what happened in Serbia, we saw what happens in other countries of the Western Balkans. Uh, there's a geopolitical vacuum there, which uh, other or the big powers uh, uh, towards the East are quite happy to, to try to fill. So I think this is a proposal which um, uh, is worth looking into and, and, and be amended. Um, but uh, 
there we have a disintegrate a post potential dis disintegration factor um, and i would like to um, quote just a couple of other uh, possible disintegration factors and to to end um, the economic shock of the war in ukraine uh, on on the european economies that we already feel i think this is also a big unknown um, and um, you know, if, if, uh, if the EU decides to grant to build a Marshall Plan for for Ukraine, how is it going to finance it? Could we set up a, a new uh, special fund like we did uh, for the, for Corona? And just to end, um, I would like to point out how important is the role that Poland is going to play in this whole thing. We've talked about the divide. I. You know, I agree it's not east-west, it's more complex than this, but there is a divide. And Poland has a new role to play. Poland has had more, has uh, gotten more importance in this, uh, in this crisis. And it can play a very positive and constructive role in Europe um, and regain its place in the EU if it plays by the rules. And I don't have to go uh, further about what, uh, what the rules means because I don't have time, but I think you all understand very well what I mean. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sylvie. I just wanted to clarify because you have said that you have been speaking about the new position of on the enlargement policy by the EU in France. And um, do you mean that also the, the status of a candidate for membership is changing. To what extent the being a candidate is understood as, um, so to say, an automatic uh, path to becoming a member? Or, or is it rather a kind of a symbolic, is it considered rather to be a kind of symbolic status that doesn't necessarily at all uh, bring uh, a real membership yeah. sometimes no i don't think it's symbolic at all i think the political meaning significance of this was very well understood in paris and that's why they couldn't resist anymore mm -hmm. uh, because uh, zelensky also ursula von der leyen and other and uh, other member states were pushing so hard and making a good case for it that france uh, and germany couldn't resist anymore uh, so but it, it, it is understood, I think, that uh, it's not just, uh, you know, a, a, a media announcement, that it has to uh, lead to something, uh, you know, to membership. But then um, it's also understood that this is not going to be easy for anybody and that it takes time. And, you know, you don't have any magical magic wand to do this. So that's why I think uh, these intermediate stages are, are trying to be imagined, but um, um, I think there's a lot of distrust among us member states about this. And I, 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 talking about disintegrating factors, this is a major factor. I think this distrust that I have felt in some of the previous, among the previous speakers, uh, is, is uh, I mean, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's very healthy to talk about differences and to uh, discuss those differences, but uh, distrust is a very negative factor. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvie. And last but not least, Petro Burkowski, please, Petro, take the floor. Uh, I uh, left you for the end uh, against the alphabetical order, uh, but I was hoping that you might, after listening to all the panelists, provide us also with a Ukrainian perspective of um, of those factors of integration and disintegration that we have been discussing. Uh, thank you, Carolina. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, uh, it's always uh, really interesting to hear from intellectuals uh, from Europe, uh, from the nations uh, which support Ukraine right now, their thoughts uh, about uh, the future, near future, and the thoughts about the current, uh, current uh, position and current situation in Europe. Uh, because Ukraine, uh, since very early years of independence, uh, uh, clearly uh, has seen itself as a part of Europe, although it was not uh, welcomed, very welcomed, uh, usually in Europe. So uh, let me just uh, build uh, my uh, speech on the uh, reflections 
given by the Olin Toffler about the three pillars of power and the three pillars of uh, attractiveness and integration in the world in the end of the uh, 20th century, because I, still, I, I think they are still relevant to the current situation. So the three pillars are the economic power, uh, whether the uh, uh, different states or unions uh, uh, can be leaders in the, in the economic sphere. And secondly, it's a uh, defense power, or uh, the, uh, the power to project its forces uh, and the armed forces uh, in the nearest uh, uh, in the nearest neighborhood. And uh, thirdly, this is a cultural factor and cultural attractiveness uh, of the countries and of the different unions. Uh, well, before our meeting, I looked through the data since our foundation is primarily is a sociological think tank. I looked through the data of Eurostat and how it's evaluated the situation in Europe before it was enlarged, so uh, in the 90s. And uh, there is a report about the income inequality uh, and uh, social exclusion uh, based on the data from 1994 to 1997, so right after the Maastricht Treaty was approved and when the European Union actually as European Union was founded uh, as an economic, uh, economic union. So, but if we look, yeah, so, uh, and the very interesting figures are the median income level and the differentiation and stratification among different countries of the European Union at that time, in fact, 15 countries. So, if in 1994, uh, five countries were below the median income level, I mean, the households uh, of these five countries uh, were below the median, uh, and the average level uh, in the European Union, uh, nine countries. Uh, plus Sweden uh, were above. But in 1997, uh, these seven countries were below the average median income level of the household, while only eight remained in the up, uh, remained uh, up, uh, had uh, the higher figures. Then, uh, so maybe it was not a tendency, but then I looked at the uh, information about the poverty, uh, income and the social exclusion and the report of Eurostat of 2020. So the figures were before the beginning of the pandemic, which had an uh, incredible effect on the uh, European uh, well-being and the uh, well-being of people. Uh, so the, uh, the picture is not very nice. Uh, 2020, or like a 13 years uh, more. Uh, sorry, it's uh, almost 20. Uh, it's 23 years after uh, after the uh, 1997. So uh, above the poverty line, the average level of the, uh, of the average income of the households were only 11 countries. Five countries were in the middle. Uh, so it means that's not, bit, uh, not bad, but not good. And uh, 10 countries were below. And uh, since it was before the pandemic, uh, the, my, uh, my uh, assumption is that uh, some countries like Italy, they went down and the poverty uh, has grown significantly. So that means that uh, uh, although European Union is, is uh, the unique integration and the unique uh, by success, a unique project uh, and in terms of economy too, but the disintegration tendencies are uh, going up. And uh, the and the populists and the sovereignists, sovereignists that were uh, mentioned by Mr. Smaller, uh, they are uh, using uh, this uh, growing gap uh, of income and growing poverty uh, to come to power and to advance their agenda. Secondly, uh, before the uh, Madrid summit, uh, uh, NATO uh, just put on their website information, also statistical information about the defense expenditures and how uh, different countries, uh, NATO member states, how they uh, use their money to, uh, to finance their defense uh, sector and defense forces. And when we compare the data of how uh, this money were used and money about the wealth countries, so uh, it seems like uh, the wealth countries are the uh, free riders. So while they are best uh, in uh, securing uh, welfare for their companies, for their people, and they are not using as much money to uh, for the collective security and for the collective defense uh, in Europe. And this data can be easily 
Uh, if you don't trust me, you can easily compare it by yourself. So finally, the third point about the culture and cultural attractiveness. Uh, for many countries uh, in the world, uh, and, uh, but uh, I will speak only about the post-Soviet space, uh, the European Union was very, very attractive in a cultural sense. Uh, so um, actually a lot of uh, Ukrainians were attracted uh, by the, not only by the rule of law, but also by the way of life in Europe. And the same, and the same is true for many Russians. Just to give you a very striking example, so this spring uh, I spent two months in Qatar at Al Jazeera, commenting the war uh, between Ukraine and uh, Russia. And in the studio, I sat uh, face to face with the Russian expert, a pure 33 years old Stalinist, a very intellectual, a very refined. And at the same time, he loves to spend vacations in Europe. And one of the best cities, he said that the Berlin is the best city. So for Stalinists in Russia, Berlin still is the nicest city to spend the uh, summer vacations. That strikes, that struck me because uh, uh, while, uh, while uh, he said that uh, Putin uh, should have been nuked Kiev on the second week of the war to stop everything, uh, but still he likes to spend uh, summer time in Berlin. I think that many Russians would like to go back to this situation. So uh, I mean that even for the hostile powers, uh, cultural attractiveness of European Union is even stronger than the uh, or uh, cultural attractiveness of the certain European countries is stronger than the military and the economic uh, attractiveness and, and economic power. Why don't you? Why don't you? Um, yeah, um, make us familiar with with your reflections of on on what you have heard uh, so far. Yes, I, I will go in a, an opposite direction. Uh, so first about the uh, uh, the remarks uh, uh, made by. Uh, in, uh, Ms. Kaufman, uh, so uh, you said that the integration of Ukraine can have negative effects. Uh, I think I understand what you mean, but imagine if we survive in this war, and if you, I mean, European Union survive from this war, what what would be uh, more adverse? I mean, except for the war. So if the both sides survive this war, and there will be no nuclear uh, uh, nuclear disaster. Yes, which is uh, always pronounced uh, by European politicians, but I think which is a coward uh, and uh, a lame excuse for doing nothing. So what uh, can be more negative? Uh, secondly, uh, the unity on sanctions. Well, when I uh, read the media reports on the Reuters that Germans are trying to push uh, Lithuanians to allow Russians to go through uh, the Suvalki Gorge and to allow and to make an exclusion from the sanctions regime uh, for the Kaliningrad, while nobody uh, nobody uh, prevents Russians to export anything they want uh, through the Baltic Sea, and the Baltic Sea is not as closed as the Black Sea for Ukrainian ships. So why? Uh, so what is the unity? What what you mean uh, 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 when you said the unity on sanctions? Uh, then the remarks uh, made. Uh, Max Greek made by uh, Mark uh, Leonard. So you said that uh, the February 24th uh, was the date when the, the security cycle ended. And you said that security cycle started in 1991. But uh, frankly speaking, uh, from 1991 until 1999, uh, there were wars in the Balkans. And I don't think that if we are uh, now, these countries are parts of the Europe and the Europeans, and that's definitely by many senses historical geographical and political uh, this was europe uh, so i don't think that the, i would only say that the period of uh, relative security in europe was just from the year of 2000 when putin was elected till 2008 when he invaded georgia georgia of course is not a part of uh, Euro europe uh, and not a part of european union uh, but still that was uh, first alarming sign that uh, Peace will be broken in Europe. I'm not speaking also about the uh, the uh, day of the 20th of February of 2013. Then Russians invaded and the next Crimea. So that uh, definitely was the end of the peace in Europe, not the February 24, 2022. Um, uh, what else uh, about this? Uh, so uh, well. Um, 
about the uh, Mark uh, Robert Cooper's remarks about this uh, that uh, EU exists, so the ex-imperial powers. Well, well, it's true, and it, uh, but uh, well, 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 it's true, and it's not a surprise that uh, right now European Union is facing the outer space, which is not very friendly for a good historical reasons, because. Uh, Sorry, I just heard the explosion near, nearby. Uh, uh, well, uh, this, uh, and for the good historical reasons, and uh, uh, when you're speaking about the security uh, in Europe, and uh, I don't remember who said this, and this is my last remark, that, ah, about the economic interdependence, that uh, it, uh, it plays a good role, but if you talk to the people in the Middle East, both from the opposition and from the ruling classes, and they will tell you how Europe used the economic interdependence to put them into subject uh, into uh, coercion and to help dictators to survive, how Germany and France uh, sold uh, arms uh, to the countries in the region and, uh, and uh, helped them to continue the wars against their own people and against their regional rivals. So actually, uh, so therefore, therefore, in the Middle East, you will not you will never be trusted by the economic interdependence, uh, I mean, that we have a lot, a lot of uh, examples and early warning signs that economic interdependence doesn't work. And one of the biggest example is the Middle East. So uh, you have to, you had to read these early warning signs from the Middle East to understand what Putin will do with the economic interdependence. So thank you. Thank you, Petra. Where are you speaking uh, to us from? Uh, from the north of the Kiev. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for your uh, remarks. Um, Sylvie, why don't you start? Yeah, thank you. Um, just to answer to Petro, um, and thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, I don't want to be misunderstood by the <laughs> disintegration factor. I'm not saying that uh, taking Ukraine as, as a candidate is a negative. I don't think so. Uh, on, on the contrary, I mean, I. I agree with you, there was no other uh, option, and I'm really glad that there was a French turnaround and, and, and other countries turn around. And, um, you know, I, I totally agree with you. The alternative would have been a disaster. So they, they don't, uh, don't uh, um, there shouldn't be any mistake on this. Uh, what I meant, because we are supposed to talk about disintegration and integration tendencies, that this according to, depending on how the process will be conducted, this could have disintegrating effects on the European Union itself. But, uh, you know, this is it, it's totally dependent on how we do it and also how uh, uh, Ukraine does it. But, you know, there are a lot of things beyond Ukraine's uh, um, uh, willingness to, you know, be, be, beyond uh, what you can do or, or what you can decide or not. So it's really uh, up to us, but this, this, this is what I wanted to say. And on unity, of course, yeah, I agree with you. It's, it was not perfect. Uh, uh, I mean, it, <laughs> but you know, the EU is not an ideal, and I think that's what we've been talking about so far. This EU is not an ideal world. And so when you are 27, uh, countries with such different outlooks on, 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 on the world and such different analysis on the strategic situation. Um, I think getting where we got to, uh, you know, was not that bad. Yeah. So, but I can uh, easily understand why we, you, you thought it was not uh, satisfying. Thank you. Um, I, I'll keep it short. So I'll, I can stay for another five minutes and then I will leave you. And thank you very much for everything. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvie. And uh, I, I saw uh, Robert Robert's hand raised yes. for a long time. Um, I, I just wanted to make I wanted to make two comments about um, uh, the awful process of enlargement, how long it takes. Um, the first comment, uh, as far as Ukraine is concerned, is that um, some parts of the of the process may actually be faster than they have been in the past. Because some time back, um, uh, I don't know when it was, it was maybe after the, uh, after the, the, the Maidan, um, uh, the Ukrainians themselves decided that they wanted to join the European Union. 
um, and they based um, all of their industries on European standards. So uh, the Ukrainians from way back have been conscious of European standards and have been trying to meet them. So there are some elements of the process of enlargement that might go quickly with Ukraine. The difficult element is not so much the kind of product standards, um, it's the standards of governance in Ukraine. Uh, it's question uh, regarding the, um, uh, the government and the, uh, and the rule of law. Um, uh, the, second, the second comment I wanted to make is that um, because the enlargement process is so long, I've often asked myself whether the EU might not consider a process by which um, when somebody had fulfilled all the requirements in, I don't know what they'll say, in fisheries, for example, um, or in agriculture, um, that they might be allowed to join council meetings as observers in that area, uh, because mm -hmm. then they would get to understand a little bit how the whole thing works and the tonality of it. They would understand the reality of European Union membership much better than they do. They wouldn't get a vote, uh, but they would be there and perhaps um, uh, if they had a kind chairman, they might be allowed to speak from time to time. And that maybe might make the, uh, the waiting period more productive and less, uh, and less boring. Mm -hmm. okay, I must say that uh, I'm in a difficult situation because I agree with everything uh, Mark, uh, Sylvie, Robert have said. And remind Robert, was a very much diplomatic uh, a European diplomat. He was the author or main author of two strategies in foreign and uh, security policies of the European Union. He's uniquely equipped to deal not only with the issues of the objectives, which I share, but with the mechanism of making things happen. And if I feel lacking some elements, is uh, to find the uh, answer to some of my worries, which I expressed in my initial expose. And it's not about nationalists being empowered, as someone has said. I think it was Mark. It's not, uh, well, of course, we should fear them. And the European Union was all about taming them. But, uh, but what, we are, what we have been facing now is not just that, uh, uh, that the objectives are wrong but the mechanism has not been fully implemented in a manner that would involve uh, not just the national elites of all member states, but also the electorates. Mm. It's not a mm. question of the future uh, 21st century uh, post-national uh, future of, of Europe. It's not, we, we have to realize that the only national elites has the ability to engage and mobilize the electorate to support all these wonderful changes which, uh, which you've put on the table. And I haven't heard much about this because when I am saying that in big part of the European Union, the present kind of a leadership uh, of Germany and France has to at least to some extent collapse, I am worried about the process. Who is going to lead the process? Who is going to set the stage? We are talking about the, uh, the, uh, about the defense policy. Just to give you an example, I had a lunch with the deputy foreign minister of Germany in Berlin when he was called off, returned after 20 minutes, and I saw on his face hesitancy and he shared with me, do you know what? The president of France just now said that he is going to make sure that the French force de frappe is going to work for the whole of Europe, including the security of Germany. And he said, but we know nothing about it. This is just one of examples of the lack of process, of lack of understanding uh, or, uh, how the things are really working in the European Union in an effective manner that uh, actually makes the whole process to be, uh, to be mismanaged. So if integration has to be reinforced, the confidence in the leadership in the European Union must be reinforced, not just in Central Eastern Europe, but also in, in, in Sweden and Finland, as we've heard before. So the sovereignists proclaim 
uh, this lack of confidence with certain tri triumph and satisfaction, but the pro-European liberal forces are keeping silent. That's what worries me. That was the point which I also try to make. And uh, what makes it fascinating is that despite the dramatic failure of the Russian policies, if the Russian bombs and atrocities didn't fundamentally change the situation, uh, also despite proven reliance once again on America to come to our aid in times of need, both countries repeat the calls for the majority vote in foreign security policies. I just don't get it because it is disruptive and it is not helpful because apparently it doesn't involve all. It's in diplomatically being unprepared and I believe it's, it's damaging. As, as we know, the European Union is a wonderful but very delicate creature, creature and it needs a carefully consciously planned process, devoid of atmospherics, devoid of verbal fireworks, devoid of egocentrism, bombshell-like surprises coming from most of the time French president, I'm afraid, La Belle France. So the better understanding of, of uh, partners' motivations, interests and fears, eventually this might lead to an agreement like it happens with everything else with the European Union. Thank you.